why don't you do all your observing of stars and galaxies in H alpha if it's so useful and it really focuses down and gets rid of all the confusion? Well, there's two questions there. One is this issue of dust, which plagues lots of questions in astronomy and makes our lives quite difficult. The other is actually isolating that wavelength. So it's fine to do it here for the sun. We know the wavelength of H alpha. We can restrict that very easily. But um, galaxies, well, the universe is expanding. They're being redshifted. So the wavelength that we observe that light from H alpha coming um, varies according to how far and how fast the galaxy is moving away from us. So while you can buy an H alpha filter that you stick in front of your camera in a big telescope, and, and it, will, it will not be as, as restricted as this, it'll have a wider band pass, that will only get you the H alpha at a particular redshift. And so if you want to look at, say, a cluster of galaxies, which is what our project is looking at, actually a, a cluster of clusters of galaxies, something I've, I've talked about to you uh, many times before, those, clust those galaxies, they're, they're, they're moving with the expansion of the universe, they're also moving back and forth due to their mutual gravitation. That means the wavelength of H alpha that we're detecting from each one of those galaxies is slightly different. So one galaxy's H alpha is not another galaxy's H alpha. Exactly. But that's where on Grantican, with the, the instrument OSIRIS that we've used, we take advantage of a mode of, that, of operation for that instrument called a tunable filter. And it works much in the same way as this one does. It's got these interference filters, and that actually lets us choose within some range the exact wavelength that we want to look at. And so what we've done is use this instrument to take many, many pictures of our galaxies and step the wavelength forward each time. And so we build up over a very small range of the electromagnetic spectrum, a really detailed look at how the emission from each galaxy changes. So each color in this data cube represents a different wavelength, a different step in our tunable filter. So first we take a picture of our field of our galaxies in one wavelength, then we take that picture in another wavelength, we step it through this isn't as smooth as I was envisaging. <laughs> we step through one wavelength at a time, and then when we put them all together, we get this cube that lets us do some really interesting things. Because it not only gives us a picture of a galaxy, but it gives us... <laughs> do I go down the hole? Only I can get it. It gives us not just a picture of a galaxy, but if you look at any one of these dots in this data cube, you can drill down that data cube and you can get a spectrum of that pixel. And you can see how, if this is, this is, the, this is how the field looks on the sky, this is spatial direction, this is wavelength direction, it's built up of lots of little spectra. And we can get a spectrum just around the H alpha line for each one of our galaxies. Or you can even make a movie. And so, this is our, this is our low-tech version, yeah. and this is an example of some of the, the data that we get. So this is one galaxy from our survey, one of hundreds. And each one of these dots and the axis on this, this is intensity of light that we're getting at each wavelength as we step through and take a different picture at each wavelength. This is what we're getting from the galaxy. And so then this peaks at this H alpha line here. There's another little bump, which is nitrogen 2, and that's a useful line because what I haven't mentioned is that star formation is not the only thing that will give us H alpha. So the other way you can get H alpha emission from a galaxy is from an active galactic nucleus, an accreting supermassive black hole. But by measuring the relative strength of those two lines, we can distinguish one from another. And so with this low-tech version, as I step through, as I flip through this little flip book, you see this, this line will move across this spectrum, and that's as if we're moving through these colors of Lego, and you see what the image of that galaxy looks like at each wavelength. And so I don't know if you can see that change. But the key thing is if you go to the middle of that stack and you find where the peak of that spectrum is, that's what that galaxy looks like in H alpha. The beauty of our survey is that we don't just have these images, and that's what that beauty of a galaxy looks like 
when you look at it with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so what we can do is if we can combine these two images, this is obviously not as impressive as this one, but we can still put one on top of the other, and we can actually, in this beautiful spiral galaxy, we can map out exactly where the star formation is happening. When we put all this data together, uh, we're only just getting started on actually getting the science out of it. It took an enormous, a heroic effort from our, our postdoc Anna and our, our PhD student Bruno to actually get the data into uh, measurable shape and produce these lovely videos and, and images and indeed the science that's coming out of it. Um, but that's been the joy of this work is that it really has been uh, very much a team effort. Well that's someone's PhD there. Yeah, this is Bruno's PhD. We have visitors to the Royal Society. We think they actually had this book specially made <laughs> because Yuri Gagarin came to the Royal Society. They oh, thought, wow. wow, we're going to need a better visitor's book. The visit of Major Yuri Gagarin to the Royal Society, 13 July 1961. Top of the heap, yeah. top left, that is Yuri Gagarin signing the book.